so, unknown pearls, or less known pearls of the, of the Closure Standard Library. Um, I'm Renzo, that is my Twitter handle uh, and GitHub account. Um, I'm behind the Closure Weekly, hopefully you're following it, uh, that would be great. Uh, and that's the, the URL. And I'm also uh, organizing a, a, a SICP study group, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programming. That is based in London, but you're welcome to follow the mailing list and to see what we are doing and also attend remotely if you want and I work at the Daily Mail, which is a, a, closure, stru a closure stack mainly. So you might not know this, talking about pearls, but in Finland you have something very peculiar. You have the oldest animal in Finland is this, is a mussel. And it's very rare in the southern part, but in the north, you might, if you like, happen to be in lakes, and you might find one of them, and they are cap capable of making very good, fine-quality pearls. And there's even a paper about that, and it's from the Helsinki University. But this is not the kind of pearls we are going to talk about today, so be sure. We are talking about more technical pearls. What is the definition I give to uh, pearls in the standard library? So it's something that lives in Closure Core, or it might live in another namespace. Uh, and sometimes you need to require the namespace, sometimes you don't need to require the namespace, even if it's in another namespace which is not Closure Core. The important thing that, uh, the important definition for, for this talk is that we are, not, we, we are not going outside Closure, we stay inside the standard library, so no dependencies are required. And I'm excluding a few usual suspects if you Google for uh, what are the, uh, the most amazing functions in Clojure? You will find maybe Juxt, here it is, the t-shirt, group by frequencies, you name it. There are very good ones. I'm avoiding those because they are very popular, so maybe. My hope is that at least you don't know one of them. Uh, if you know all of them, it, that, that's great as, as well. Um, so I'll ask maybe for a, a short show of ends before each one of them. I have 10, more or less, to see how many of you know this specific function. So we'll start with destructure. Shows of end, how many of you knows that there is a destructure function in Closure Core? Good. Two. That's amazing. All right. Destructure. So it's... Um, it's mainly for debugging purposes. So you pass it a, f an, a form, uh, like that one that you're seeing on the slide, and what it does is it just shows you what will happen if you use that form to destructure something. So in a let, in a function, definition, and so on. And it, if, if, you, if you like type this at the REPL, you will see, for example, this output. I just cleaned it up a little bit because it's uh, generating uh, a lot of noisy symbol names, uh, otherwise it's like that. And it might be useful sometimes when you are working on some not so easy to understand destructuring form and you want to see how it looks like without actually trying it, and you can try destructure and see how it is destructured. It's also useful to understand if something is not working in your destructuring form, what is going wrong, and you see the expansion of it. It's like macro expand for destructuring enclosure. Next pearl, reductions. How many of you know what reductions is? All right, a few more. But still, I'm very happy to see that I'm, I'm, I'm telling you something new. Again, it's the uh, same class of, uh, 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 of this structure is maybe mostly for debugging. And if you use reductions, it's very similar to reduce, but in, instead of just showing you the, the final result, in this case is 45, the final element of the list, it's showing you all the intermediate steps. Again, useful to understand if you have some uh, interesting function that is doing uh, a reduce, a reducing function, uh, if it's complicated, it's useful, useful to see what, what's going on. And you can see the entire list of all the steps, and if you do last of that list, last of reductions of plus range plus, uh, plus range 10, that is going to be equivalent to reduce plus range 10. Test. So apart from like testing, but there is a function in the standard library, closure core test, um, 
and anyone has ever used this. So test is um, an interesting thing. So in Clojure, you, you have several layers of testing or, or options for testing. The most basic one that doesn't require any uh, dependency is this one, uh, along with preconditions as well. Um, basically, you can embed a surgeon inside the metadata for uh, a death. Uh, when you have that with that format, so the key is going to be test, then you, you can invoke this embedded test in the function definition using the test function. Uh, last line, what is triggering it. And in order to invoke it, you invoke it on the dereferencing of, for example, in this case, add plus of that definition. Why it is useful? Uh, well, it's the only, it is one of the fewest languages that I know where you can have tests so close to the code that is actually being under test. So when you do testing in a separate file, that I think is great, and is probably the way to go for most of the cases. But this gives you a possibility, if you want a quick test to document something not easy to understand about the function, you stick it, sticking it in the function itself. Um, interesting. And you can do this outside the box. Let's move on. We are outside Closure Core now, but still you don't need any dependency and you don't need any require for this, I think, as well. Um, how many of you knows about this CL-format? Probably former Lispers. Um, this is an implementation of the Gloria, glorious Common Lisp format function. So this format function in Common Lisp can do really incredible things. Uh, it, also, it also has a learning curve. You need to learn a little bit how it works. Um, so here are two examples. So if you need to expand a number into its, its textual form, English form, you can use that format and will expand it to 1,000 and so on. You can do pluralization, like pluralize this English word. Or you can do numerals, um, Roman numerals. And as I said, you can do much more. There is an extensive um, documentation, and the documentation in the namespace is also pointing you at the original documentation of the Lisp function. Again, out of the box. Another out of the box thing. Um, browse URL. Um, has anyone ever used this or know about it? Well, useful, yeah. Um, the, I think the main purpose of this is you, you have the possibility to programmatically start a browser pointing at some URL. When that is useful, well, it's up to you and up to the kind of application you are designing. It can be also useful at the REPL if you want to quickly open up a browser pointing at some URL. You can do that. And this will take care of uh, the operating system you're on, how to invoke the default browser, and, and so on. Similar to this, um, Javadoc. Um, Sometimes, so if you're doing a lot of Java interoperation in Clojure, you, you, you might be jumping in and out from the Java docs of Java to see like, you know, a function, a method, and so on. And this one is a handy REPL thing that uh, opens you up a Java doc pointing at the class, at the type that you pass in the function. So you can see there, Java doc list, for example. Since list star is returning a cons, this will open up closure line cons documentation. And it is doing this, this in a smart way, so it's got a list of default locations where to look for, uh, for Java docs, even locally, if you have installed them. And you can override that list with those dynamic bars. A little bit more of uh, the Java interop thing. Uh, shows events, reflect, anybody? Has ever used Reflect? Okay, still pretty much unknown. Um, in, this case, in this case, you, you, you need to require it and in order to use it. It just means that during Closure Bootstrap, this require is not automatically done by Closure Core itself. But still, not far away, out of the box, no dependencies needed. Um, this is like Java Reflection on steroids, if you know what Java Reflection is, but it's basically the, the way Java introspect itself. 
and it, this is a very short extract of what happens when you do reflect on a type or an object, and then the type is derived from the object. And it gives you all the possible information about the Java type of it. So uh, variables, fields, methods supported, signatures of each method, and so on. And it's, it's giving, giving you this as like a complicated map with several levels, maybe. Uh, but you can easily then filter it and programmatically process it and so on. With that in mind, there's the inspector tree. The inspector package contains the inspector tree. It's all, it also contains other things like uh, inspecting tables or lists. And what things this thing does, for, for example, in the case of like a, a big map with a lot of nested things in it, uh, exactly what you can obtain if you do a JSON parse, for example, into uh, a closure data structure. And you can visualize this as a very simple swing UI. Nonetheless, uh, it might be useful. I've, I've used it one week ago for the first time, uh, for real. And I had one of these JSON data structure I wanted to read, and it was completely uneasy to read in any possible way, uh, even when it was printed with all the formatting. And with this one, I, I got a very good idea of where my problem was in that map, and, I, and then I acted accordingly, again out of the box. We are close to the end. Uh, persistent queue. So there are many data, data structures in Clojure, right? But this one is one of those that it doesn't have a Clojure literal to start with, and that's why maybe it's not very known, because in order to create one of these persistent queues, you don't have like uh, any specific syntax, like uh, open parentheses, square brackets, and so on. Um, you need to do it that way, like calling, invoking the empty static method on the persistent queue class. Um, what is a persistent queue? Well, it's, if you go in the literature, it's quite an interesting data structure. It's a functional data structure, so it's persistent, is a queue. It means that you can do the normal operation that you do on a, on a queue. Normally you do in a queue, like uh, looking at the head, pushing something in the queue. But every time you do this operation, what you receive back is uh, another queue with the item either removed or pushed in. Um, it's got a few interesting uses. Um, one of them, a few, a few examples are buffers, that you can send around, and since these are persistent queues, you don't need to think about locking and synchronization and things like that. Uh, if you open up the, the, the namespace for this, you will, you will see Rich commenting on uh, the, the, the data structure and saying, literature for this is uh, Okasaki uh, functional data structures. It's in that book. I think this is the last. Uh, how many of you have, uh, have ever heard, uh, heard of uh, FNIL? Okay, that's good. It's an interesting little function. This is core. You don't need to require anything. You just use it as is. It's got a few applications. I think uh, the most interesting one is uh, when, you have, when you need a default in case of a null or something that is nil that is passed to a function that you're, you don't own, so you cannot change it. And this FNIL can wrap this function, and you tell FNIL what should happen when this function, you pass nil to this function. So one case is when you have Java interop, that usually, in case of nils, throw, um, throws null pointer exceptions. And this is one example. You have an the environment that is coming from the outside. You load it as a map. Everything nice, but for some reason, the port is null. What you do? This is one option. There are other ways to do this. Uh, but if you use FNIL, you can parse the string as an int, at, a, at the same time checking that if it's nil, it should return a default value in one go. And that is an example of how to use it. A few honorable mentions before we, we close the talk. Um, so it's a very subjective list. So it's what I consider interesting for this audience. Um, you might have a completely different view and very nice function to talk about. I'd be happy to hear. These are a few other honorable mentions. Countant and re reversible. Uh, 
uh, will tell you if the cl this closure data structure that is returning true or false will support uh, constant time uh, counting or reversing. There are some of them that can, and if you know when to use them, it, it, it of course increases performances. Vector off is uh, again about performances. It can create unboxed vectors of primitives, so no no boxing and unboxing of objects. If you know of that, if you know that this vector will always contain one type, like int, long, and so on. Rename keys is very useful, but is in the wrong. Maybe it's in the wrong package, it's in closure set. And I think many times I had uh, the problem of having this map coming from some place, and I want to rename the keys, either because they are camelized, camel case, and so on, into something else. And this is exactly it. It's going to do that for you. No like fancy stuff required. Diff is very useful, um, it's going to compare basically every closure data structure, and it's going to give you uh, another closure data structure that is telling you where the differences are. So then programmatically you can uh, go through these differences and decide what to do. Very useful. Um, a few others that are not documented at all, like Munge, uh, Gensimis, uh, the secret thing, and Zippers, oh my god. So there are many more. Um, maybe the takeaway from this talk is Look inside the closure standard library, pick a function that you don't know, and have a look every day and see what you can, uh, how, can you, how can you use it in your, your daily closure. This is the end. Um, if you have any questions, I think there, there are two or three minutes, but instead of questions, if you want, you could just tell me what is your favorite pearl. I will be very happy to hear it. Thank you. <laughs>